Well, hello, friend and family. Thank you once again for joining me once again for another session in the kingdom. We're back again. Um, I just came off vacation, had a great time in Jamaica over Christmas time. Hopefully you had a great time with your friends and family as well in the season, um, the Christmas holidays. And those of you who hanging out with friends and family, they had a great time as well. I'm back to pick up where we left off last time, teaching on the book of Revelation, chapter 1. My hope tonight is to finish up the, in this part 3. My hope is I can get it done tonight, so we have to extend it over into a fourth part. But I have a lot of material, like I said, to cover. Hi, Ruthie. Welcome aboard. And we're looking forward to studying once again on this section on the book of Revelation, chapter 1. Then uh, hopefully come back starting chapter 2. Well, I'm going to pick up three parts, as I said before. Chapter 1, 2, and 3. Um, to give you some information, I'm taking my time. Hi, Victoria. Let's go through this methodically. Um, that... Um, that we'll get some insight into the revelation of John in chapter 1, 2, and 3. And my hope is that you had a great holiday with this time with friends and family. And for those of you joining for the first time, welcome aboard. I'm um, looking forward to a great series of study in this message on revelation because I think many people have interest in knowing about these revelations by Daniel as well as by John and uh, how to basically put them together to see a picture of our end times. <clears throat> There are some serious things that are taking place in our world right now, and I'm thinking myself, as they had received revelation back in their time, it's applicable to us today because we are now living in the time that they foresaw as visions and dream of their time, but now becomes our reality today. And my hope is that to bring some clarity, some insight into that, and maybe answer some question for you. <clears throat> as I said before, this revelation is not for the believer per se. But it's for those who are seeking answers uh, pertaining to question to what may be taking place in our world today. Signs of our time, if you wish. Um, I say it over and over again, the reason why this book doesn't really scare me is that I read it. Because this book is, um, <clears throat> is not written for the believer who understand. We walk in kingdom knowledge, wisdom, understanding. But it's written for those who may be outside of the understanding to recognize they're not coming to a relationship with God. And so... As a part of that, there's going to be a day of judgment coming for all of us. Whether we believe or not, does not matter. The Bible is very clear about that. We'll stand before the Lord giving an account of ourselves. Each one according to their deeds, what they have done in word and in deed. So because we understand that, <clears throat> as we study the book of Revelation, and we walk in righteousness, then our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. There's no fear in that. We'll talk a little bit about that tonight, about the books that were open. And we hope we'll give you insight into that as well. But we have a lot of material to cover, and I just want to... Give everybody a chance to get in to join us. But when we hit the road running, I got a lot of material to cover. Um, it's an exciting time. It can be a scary time for many who are stepping into kingdom knowledge, wisdom, understanding. But you need to be fearful when you learn how to walk in righteousness. All right. So with that being said, let me get started because I got a lot of material to cover. And I want to try and then make an attempt to finish this up um, tonight if I can. As you know, we left off last week, chapter 1. We had gotten all the way up into verse 10. And we're looking at verse 9 through 11 in the book of Revelation, chapter 1. And so what I've been doing is breaking that down for you individually, okay? So we're going to start off with the vision of the Son of Man. This is John's revelation um, in Revelation, chapter 1, verse 9. John, I, John, both brother and companion in tribulation, and the kingdom and the patience of Jesus Christ was on the Isle of Patmos. We're going to talk about Patmos. Where is Patmos? What is Patmos? For the word of God, for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Verse 10, I was in the spirit in the day of the Lord, and I described that to you last time, and I heard behind me a loud voice as a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in the book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. <clears throat> So here we see John as a brother and companion in tribulation. We talked about this a little bit last week. In tribulation. What was in tribulation? Because tribulation, the word tribulation means in distress or suffering resulting from oppression or from persecution. Why? Because of the message that he brought forth of the revelation of Jesus Christ. And the kingdom, the kingdom is not a religion. The kingdom is a country ruled by a sovereign or a king. That's the word king domain. King is a sovereign, birth into power, and his dominion or domain is the word dom, king domain, and thus he's the king. So because of this our knowledge and understanding about God's kingdom, which the kingdom I described to you last time as the governing influence of a king over a territory, he influenced the territory with mind, will, and intent, 
He chooses a citizenry that reflects his nature and his culture. That's what a kingdom is. A kingdom is not a religion. Very important for us to keep emphasizing that because most are misconstruing the church with a religion and Jesus as a religious man when Jesus is a king. And you're going to see in Revelation chapter 1 where he talks about the crown. You're going to see in the book of Daniel where he's crowned. If he was a preacher, he would have gotten a robe or a pulpit, but he's sitting on the throne. So we need to shift our mind over from a religious thinking to a kingdom thinking. And with the patience of Jesus Christ, John was exiled for his witness of Jesus Christ as king and the kingdom message. That's the reason he was exiled to the Isle of Patmos, okay? Because it was during the Roman time. I'm going to give you some insights into that right now. Let's continue study. Patmos <clears throat> is a Greek island in the Aegean Sea. It is presently called Patino today, okay? Patmos is called Patina today. So Patmos is still there, except now it's called Patina, and it's in the Aegean Sea. Now I'm going to show you a picture of that, that I pulled up to show you exactly where Patmos was in comparison to biblical time. So when you look at it, Asia Minor, I'm going to turn this around real quick for you so you can see it. So you have a visual picture. This was it right here. This is Asia Minor. By the way, that image you're looking at right now, Patmos is an island off the coast of Turkey. Asia Minor is Turkey, all right? And these were the seven churches located there. So he was he was exiled off of, out of Turkey at that time, called Asia Minor, and he was sent to the Isle of Patmos, which was a Roman island, ruled and put in place for those who were in opposition to the governments. I want you to see that so you have a perspective in your mind when you hear the word. And it's interesting for you to hear that word Turkey because that word's going to come up again. You're going to see in chapter 2. We're going to talk about Asia Minor, where it's located, because you're going to see some very interesting thing about that country, Turkey. Now, most are not aware of right now, uh, but we'll talk more about that as we continue teaching. So, Patmos is a Greek island in, in the Aegean Sea, which is right parallel to Turkey, present-day Patina, a small island in the Aegean Sea. Philney, the elder in his natural history, says that the site is about 30 miles in circumference, Right? And it lays next to the churches of Asia Minor. It lays next to, that means it's in Turkey parallel to that, on the continent. And it's said to be 40 miles southwest of Ephesus, from whence John came, and that's where he dwelt. Uh, to which church he writes, how he came here, he it does not say, concealing though modesty, his suffering, he did not come here of his own accord. So we now understand that. Not much information can be found from the ancient writing about the specific charge that put John in exile here apart from his own testimony because of the witness about Jesus. Now, remember now, he was in the Roman culture who worshipped many gods, right? They worshipped uh, Diana, Zeus, Hera, all different gods. Thus, he comes there just like Paul, present his case of the kingdom, and thus he was exiled to that island because of his witness, except for from a few writing of the church fathers. Ignatius, in his epistle to Tarsus, says that John was banished to Patmos by um, Domitian, which is King Domitian, emperor of Rome, and Arrhenius, in his Against Heresy, says it happened at the latter end of Domitian reign, about the year 95 to 96. In Rome, Roman times, Patmos was one of the many places to which Rome banished her exiles. In 95 AD, according to the tradition preserved by Arrhenius, um, Isubius, and Jerome and others, John was exiled here in the 14th century, 14th, in the 14th year of the reign of Domitian, whence he returned to Ephesus under Nerva in 96 AD. Okay, that's the reason it was put there. He was sent there. There's not a lot of detail about how, why he was sent, but I think because of his teaching on this Jesus. Remember, Jesus now as a king, he's teaching about the kingdom. Thus, if you understand anything about Roman culture, any other king beside themselves was a threat to them. And thus, they want to make sure they put it down. Thus, you're going to understand the story of the three wise men heading through Jerusalem. And um, the king found out that they were going to worship this newborn king. And he's saying, go and find out where he is so that I too may go and worship him. But he didn't want to worship because they cared about him. They were worship because they were trying to kill the king. And you find out in history when you study Israel. Hey, Elliot, welcome aboard, my friend. You know, when you study out Israel, is that this particular king went about and started killing every child born under four years old. He would put them to death because he's trying to kill a king. Because a king represents a new kingdom and a new new competition or threat to his kingdom rule. And it cannot be allowed. You cannot have two kings rule in the same territory. There will be a battle for dominance of territory, land, and power. It's just how it works in kingdom time. 
Okay, verse 12, 12 through 20 of um, Revelation chapter 1, verse 12 through 20. Look at that. <clears throat> so we now know he was exiled to the island of Patmos, which is parallel to Turkey. Verse 12, then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Very interesting word. I described to you before in my previous teaching about the sevens in your Bible. So here we see seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lands, someone like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, girded about the chest with a golden band. Hmm. When you look at that, you can describe it, and it's going to describe it here. Oh, let me continue on, because it gives its own description, okay? But I want you to see that. His feet girded about his chest with a golden band, and his head and hair was like wool. You, where have you read that before? You heard that many times through our scripture. As white as snow, his eyes were like a flaming fire. His feet were like fine brass, as refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Verse 16, he had in his right hand seven stars. There's another seven again, seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in his strength. Interesting word. Verse 17, and when he saw, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Very interesting word. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. It's amazing to me when people think about this great king, lord, master, in this case, the great <clears throat> ancient of day, or I am, or God himself. It does not say anywhere where anyone encountered him. They stood up and they bowed down and they talked with him. No, they fell down as dead with the count as the appearance of this mighty king whose eyes are like a flame. You don't stand up to that and start to have a discussion. You'll bow down, fall down, flatten your face as if dead. <laughs> Just, you're going to see this repeated over and over again through our scripture. I do not find anywhere a man stand before God in his boldness, confidence, going to title a talk with Jesus. It's not here. Okay, very important. Verse 17, and when, he's, when I saw him, I felt his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, very interesting word, also the right hand, saying to me, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Verse 18, I am he who lives and who was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. We now know who that is, don't we? Our Savior, our Lord. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Verse 19, write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstand. The seven stars are, the seven stars are the angel of the seven churches. Interesting. And the seven lampstand which you saw are the seven churches. Ah, so in representation, the seven angel are the seven angel of the seven churches, which is the ones I described to you earlier, which is the church of what? Is for each church have an angel that watches over them, I guess, or cares for them, or you may say protect them. Is the church, one angel for the church of Ephesus, one of Smyrna, one of Pergamos, one of Thyatira, one of Sardis, one of Philadelphia, and one of Laodicea. So the angel assigned to those churches. Interesting. Which I saw, and the seven lands that we saw are the seven churches themselves. Now we're going to I'll show you something later on that kind of give you an imagery, a physical picture for you to see what that means. Verse 12, look at verse 12 again. And go back now, read that. I need to read that to you, and I'm going to break that down for you. Verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice of one who spoke to me. Having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. The imagery of seven golden lampstands referred to seven branded lampstands in Jerusalem temple, according to Exodus 25, 31, and 32. Right? That's the example. The lampstand represents that, an imagery of it. Right? Exodus 25, 31, 32. And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. A beaten work shall be the council be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knobs, and his flowers shall be of the same. And the sixth branch shall come out of the side of it, three branches of the candlestick out of one side, and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side. So it's six starting out the candlestick, and one in the midst of it, right? Zechariah 4 says also, verse 1 and 2, Zechariah 4 Chapter 4, verse 1 through 2. And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that I wake out of sleep. And he said to me, What seest thou? And I, and I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick, all of gold, and with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof. We repeat it over and over again, describing this particular seven lampstands. Representing the seven churches, right? And so we see this process repeated over and over again. The scenario of John hearing God's message begin, beginning behind him, echoes the encounter um, with God from Isaiah 30, 21. Isaiah 30, 21. 
and that ear shall hear the word behind thee. And Ezekiel 3.12. And I hear behind me a voice of great rushing. Um, these seven lampstands are like those which decorate in the interior of the tabernacle. And thou shalt make the seven lampstands, according to Exodus 25.37, are comparable to those in the vision of Zechariah. And his seven lamps, Zechariah 4.2. As in the tabernacle, natural lights were excluded. Only the lamps that would emanate light in the temple. And as a result of that, they had to have these particular design in the temple. Verse 13. And in the midst of the seven lamps, there one like the son of man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, girded about the chest with a golden band. Ah, the son of man. So in the midst of the church, there is Christ, our Messiah, the one who holds it all together. He is the source of everything within the churches. He is in the midst of them. So once again, God dwell amongst us. That's the same word, right? Hmm. Wow. The seven lamb stands by, by seven oil field channel like a menorah. Now this is a menorah. Hmm. Interesting. It should have it, huh? Well, my wife and I took this to, to Jamaica to celebrate our Christmas Hanukkah. And this is what a menorah looked like. See the branches, the base of it, how we ought to be made. Same description we're reading here. This one is. And in the midst of it is the Son of Man that holds all together. This is the eight day celebration according to the Jews of the Hanukkah celebration. They, it's called the season of lights. And they celebrate the light. Jesus is the light of the world. Thus, he's in the midst of the churches, being the light to the world. Wow. So, I just want to give you some visual so you get an idea of what this talk about when it's described in your Bible. <clears throat> um using the Old Testament author and most frequent in the New Testament, Jesus is called Jesus called himself the light of the world. Now the talks about the garment and the garment, the same garment of rank worn by the high priest during the Mosaic dispensation is worn by Christ. The same Greek word used for ephod, that's the word used by the high priest when he entered the temple, he was covering him up. It was a Sash, just like we saw describing in that time, Exodus 28 4, as well as Josephus, who stated that the high priest's robe went down to the feet in the, in the book of Antiquities and is girded with a golden band, same as the girdle of the ephod for the priest, and the gorgeous girdle of his ephod shall be of gold. So we see the gold being repeated. So the imagery of rep repetition through the Old Testament, New Testament is amazing, all the way to Revelation to the book of Daniel. You're going to see it again. We'll talk a little bit about that later on. Verse 14, his head and hair were like, like wool, white as snow, his eyes like flame of fire. Christ is the resurrected, in his resurrected state, identified with mankind as well as with obvious divine nature, as John describing in language characteristic of Old Testament description of God, such as the Ancient of Days. That's the greatest name that God name is given to him. It's called the Ancient of Days. He's the oldest one in existence. From him became... Everything was created for him, by him, and through him. He's the oldest in existence, the ancient of days. That means he's older than days, basically. That's what it's called, ancient. Before time was, he is. When time is gone, he still will be. He has no beginning, he has no end. Thus, he's ancient by our understanding because we're measuring him by a, a, a system called time. Time cannot be used to measure God. God is outside of time. He does not measure time by the circumference of the earth around the sun because he's timeless. So he would never use that short measurement. But we need it in time so we can quantify day and night. That's the reason why we have the sun, moon, and star. So we can define the different days, times, hours, seasons. Ah, but time is for us. It's not for God. <laughs> okay. Whose hair was like a pure wool, and his hair of his head like the pure wool. Daniel 7, verse 1 through 18. We're going to look at that in a minute. Daniel 7 is going to describe him again, just like you saw in Zechariah. He's going to describe him again in the same description. And the messenger of the vision of Daniel, whose eyes are lamps of fire, and his eyes as lamps of fire. Daniel 10, 6. Revelation 14, 14. Then I look and behold a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man. Having his, on his head a golden crown. Very interesting for you to pay attention to what's going on here. Revelation 14, 14. Now look and behold a white cloud. And on the cloud sat one like the son of man. Having on his head a golden crown. Very interesting word. He didn't walk around like the Pope. He didn't walk around like a pastor. I know this stuff. He's got a crown in the head. I mean, now no only kings wear a crown. And in his hand a sharp sickle. 
we see in the midst of the golden lampstand is the son of man dressed in his garment as a king. Very important word for you to see there. A garment down to the feet and girdle about the chest with a golden band. That's the colors of king. The, the usually things that wear is gold around them representing wealth, fame, glory, honor. You'll find Solomon where you'll find David probably had the golden um, band around his chest as a king as well. Now let's look at Daniel chapter 7, verse 113. Daniel chapter 7, Old Testament time. He gives what we are reading from John. It's a, John's confirming what Daniel had the vision prior to hundreds of years before even John had his vision. Daniel chapter 7, verse 113. In the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and vision of, the, of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel spoke and said, I saw in a vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heavens um, strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion, and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings there was plucked, and he was lifted up from the earth, and made to stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Verse 5, And behold, another beast, a second like a bear, and it was raised up on one side, and had three ribs in, its, in the mouth of it, of it, between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this, I behold another, like a leopard, which was upon the back of its four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. Verse 7. And this I saw in the night vision. Behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke into pieces and stamped, stamped their residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. It had ten horns. And I considered the horns, and behold, there came upon amongst them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horn plucked up by the root. And behold, in this horn were eyes, like the eyes of men, and a mouth speaking great things. And I beheld till the throne was cast down, till the throne was cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit whose garment was white as snow, and of the hair of his head like pure wool, his throne like a fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. Verse 10. A fiery stream issued, came forth from him, for him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. Verse 11, and behold, then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spoke, we have to define who the horn is. I beheld e even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Verse 12, as concerning the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away. Yet there were they were prolonged for a season in their time. And I saw in the night vision, and behold, one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven. See it there again? First you just where he sat upon the cloud, was given the crown. And now the Son of Man again came with the cloud. Same clothes sitting on, he's traveling. And came to the Ancient of Days, which we now describe to you as his father. And they brought him near before him. And there was given to him dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all people, nation, language should serve him. Right? So what Jesus is going to receive as his inheritance is a kingdom where all people, nation, tribe, and tongue shall serve him. He will have complete dominion authority. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and which shall not pass away, and his kingdom which shall not be destroyed. So his kingdom is eternal, his power will be eternal, and he shall not be destroyed. Verse 15. And I then grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the vision of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me, and made me know the inter interpretation of the things. Now these, verse 17, these great beasts, which are four, are four kings. Oh, are you seeing there? Four kings. So when you see the word here, Four great beasts, that's going to show us in the book of Revelation, you're going to find out there are four kings. Okay, So if you study Daniel's vision and his interpretation by the angel who spoke to him, he gave him the revelation of what he was seeing. There are four kings which shall rise up out of the earth. Four dominion king power that shall take the earth. You may say that quantum, they rise up out of the earth. 
But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Okay, so the saints shall overcome. Revelation is going to tell you that as you go further on, as you read the study book of Revelation, we'll find out the saints of God will take possession of the kingdom. Verse nineteen. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, right, uh, which was diverse from all the other, exceeding dreadful, dreadful, whose teeth were of iron. And his nail of brass. Interesting what this is describing here. Does this sound to you like this is describing teeth as iron, nails of brass, which the bog break into pieces and stamp the residue with his feet, and of ten horns that are were in his head, and of, of the other which came up, and before who were three fell, even of that horn that had eyes. And a mouth that spoke very great things, who looks was more stout than his fellows. Verse 21, I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Who is this? Who is this little horn? Who is this great mouth that's speaking? The Antichrist. Hmm, that you're going to see in Revelation that we're going to study and we're studying out. You're going to find out in Daniel had the same vision of him. He's called the little horn. But he boasts great things against the knowledge and the name of God. Thus here is in Daniel, you're going to see him in Revelation again. Where he, he now, he has everything that is worship. He exalted himself above all that is worship on the earth. And he cursed the name of God. That's him in Daniel. And you're going to find he does the same thing in Revelation as well. As John gets his revelation, you're going to find he's doing the same thing. Where anything that is exalted, he exalted himself above it. He boasts great things. He's been given power for a set series of time to manifest signs of wonder. Even pulling down fire from the sky, he'll have that power. But the whole idea is to shape the earth back. And by the way, we look at all these things talking about kings and kingdom. You know what it's all about? The times that we're in in our earthly system is called the time of the Gentiles. What's the time of the Gentiles? The time of the Gentiles is a time where we as individual human beings have the right to individual rights. In other words, Independent thinking, independent action, my own personal right. What is this tribulation all about? It's to shape the earth back into kingdom rule again. See, mankind left his own freedom, independence, to govern himself. We are failing miserably at that. However, when we have a taste of freedom, it's very difficult for a person to give up being free to do what they want to do. Now, in order to get them to a place where they're willing to submit to the authority of one king, then God has to stir up. And what he's using here, in my mind, is using the kingdom of darkness and the Antichrist and the false prophet to stir the world back to a place where it's ruled by the mind of one. Lucifer wants that position where he has authority and dominion over all the earth, but yet God knows he's the rightful heir of that, and thus he's using him as the means to subject mankind back into kingdom thinking, where it's no longer my independent thought, my individual right, but it's the mind of the king. We are his subject, and thus we have no right to independent thinking, but we submit our will to his will. So this is not happening by chance. We have tasted in the world Freedom, independent thought, our own rights to do what we want to do, believe what we want to believe, act any way we want to. So how do you give that up unless there's a pressure added for us to be willing to give it up recognizing that we've tried the idea of many heads leading us, such as government system, we have tried democracy, we have tried theocracy, we have tried socialism, we've tried every type of ism out there, we are the rulership. Is controlled by people who are may not be fair and just in their judgment. And thus we are looking for righteousness in leadership. The dominion power of a just ruler that will lead us in the right path. And thus God is shaping the world back into the concept of kingdom rule, kingdom living. Here's what I want to say to you to conclude it. Is that folks, whether you believe it or not, the idea of being led by the mind of many heads, the time has come to an end. It will only be the mind of the one, the king. I, the king. Our opinion won't matter because you'll subject yourself to the rulership of the king. His authority, his power, his rights. And because he's a righteous king, you'll have no problem serving and subjecting yourself to him because he has your best interests at heart. So this, in my mind, as I read this revelation, is about shaping the earth back into kingdom rule. At one time in history, by the way, you, most of you do not know this, it was ruled by kings. The people had no individual rights. 
is the submodern time comes into play. More and more rights were given to the individual, given to the subject, given to the citizens. But it was not always that way, if you study it out. Because it was all ruled by the mind of one, the king. Ah, so this is going to be, even though we are away from it right now, we're going to be shaped back into that again. All right? So I just want to give you that's what these things are happening. And why I believe that this is all setting up to culminate where the king comes and have complete dominion of the heavens and the earth and be ruled by a rod of iron with Jesus sitting on the throne, 12 thrones of the disciple, and he'll rule and shape the earth into one mind and it will serve the king. Hmm. Let's continue. Verse 19, then I would know the truth of the fourth beast. I just read that to you. Verse 20, and of the ten horns wearing in, in his head, and of the other which came up, and before him there were three fell, even of the horn that had eyes, and a mouth that speak great things, whose looks was more stout than his fellows. Be I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints, and prevailed against them. Guess what? Many who are saints, followers of Christ, who walk in obedience, will be overcome by this little horn, by this great mouth. He'll prevail against the same. He'll put many of them death to death. Revelation going to tell you. We'll talk about it later on in Revelation chapter 20. We talk about he will be dead, behead them. He'll put many righteous people to death. Hmm. They'll prevail against them until the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. The time will come when they will possess the kingdom. Thus, he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth which shall be diverse from all of the kingdom, shall devour, devour the whole world, and shall tread it down, and break it into pieces. What's he trying to do that for? Well, the whole world has had a taste of independency. So if a new kingdom come up, it's going to destroy all that man has believed in, and establish a new authority, it makes him have to break it to pieces to rebuild it again. Ah, hmm. Verse 24, And the ten horns out of the ten kingdoms are ten kings, kings that shall arise. Ten kings. We have to keep reading these and pay attention to what's going on here. Not ten chattis, not ten passes. Okay, we need to pay attention because it says ten kings. Hmm. Wow, I can go into a lot more to describe the why ten kings, but that, let's leave that there, okay? It says, and ten horns out of the out of the little horn, right? The, 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 the great beast, that fourth one, who broke the earth into pieces and shattered it. He had ten horns, right? And now that's ten kingdom. That in Revelation will tell you will give them his power for an hour for the fame of it, and he'll take their power from them. So we're going to read about that later on in Revelation. But I want to give you a foreshadow when we get there, so you know where it's coming from. And the ten horns out of the kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them, and shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings of the ten, and shall speak great word against the Most High. There's the word. That's the Antichrist. He shall speak great work against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Uh-huh. So he's going to put them to death. And think to change the times and the laws. You will have no other God beside me. The times, he's going to try to change them and the laws to meet whatever he wants it to meet. He's going to do that. And they shall be given into his hand until time times and the dividing of time. In other words, he will have total dominion over the saints. If you're here on the earth, he'll rule them. He'll put them to death, but he have the dominion right to rule over them here on the earth. Verse 26, but the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion. So he's going to lose in the end to consume and to destroy it unto the end. He's going to lose in the end, right? His kingdom shall be taken, shall be destroyed. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and shall have dominion and shall serve and obey Him. There's the word. Shaping mankind back into king dominion, rulership, dominate and control. Hitherto is the end of the matter. As for Daniel, my, my, my cognition is the word he used, most, most trouble, and my countenance changes me, but I kept the matter in my heart. So Daniel give his description of what he saw, sound very familiar to what John is describing, but Daniel had his before John did. So as a continue to remind us, these things have not yet come to pass, but we shall see them as we go further into time. Daniel 10, 5 and 6 then says, Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loin were girded with fine gold of Euphaz. His body was like of beryl, and his face the appearance of lightning. 
and his eyes as lamp of fire, and his arm and his feet like the color of polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. So we see more and more taking place where he's been describing our coming Messiah in the form of a king and what he would look like in their description. Verse 16, now, of Revelation chapter 1, verse 16. I'll read it to you and we go back and break it down. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth was a he went a sharp twig sword, right? And his countenance, countenance here represents his appearance, face, when he considers expression of a person's character or mood was like the, the sun shining. In other words, it was radiant and it was glowing in his strength. Now, in his right hand here, look at what he means in his right hand. He had the seven start in his right hand. Right hand represents God's ultimate power and authority, where the exalted Jesus Christ now sits. He sits at the right hand of God the Father in heaven, right? So in his right hand represents the ultimate power and authority given to him. Exodus 15, 6 says, Your right hand, O Lord, is majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has shattered the enemy. Going to Psalms 118, 15 and 16. Shout for joy, salvation resound in the tent of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord performs his valor. Verse 16, the right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord performs his valor. In Psalms 89, verse 13 through 14, mighty is your arm, strong is your hand. Your right hand, had, hand is exalted. Verse 14, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Very important word. Are you seeing the commonality here? Between thrones, kingdom, and the laws established within the kingdom. Right hand represents the position of power and authority, but is within the kingdom rule. Hmm. Right hand represents this arm of strength. Our righteousness is the law or the established law within a kingdom. Righteousness, justice are the foundation of your throne. That which supports and what the kingdom is built on is righteousness and justice. Thus the king wants his authority to rule the people. If you understand he's a righteous judge, he's just in what he does, then you can trust him with your life that he's not going to take advantage of you or abuse you, but he has your best interest at heart. So if that's the standard of his kingdom, the reason why he wanted to shape the earth back into the kingdom mindset, the mind of one versus the mind of many, is because you now know the one who rules is a righteous king and he's just and he's fair and he's equitable and he's very giving, loving, kind. He died for his citizens and as a result of that, he can be trusted. That's the reason we started to shape the earth back into the image of a just ruler and king. So now if the foundation, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne, loving devotion, faithfulness go before you. His mouth represents his spoken word, went as a sharp two-edged sword. Now, where do we find the word sharp two-edged sword from in the Bible? Hebrew chapter 4, verse 12 through 13. What is that sharp two-edged sword? Right? That's in Revelation chapter 16. What is that? Here it is. It's in Hebrew chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. For the word of God. So comes out of his mouth is his word. His word is a sword. This is what the word does. The word of God is living and active. Sharper than a double-edged sword. That's the word. God's word represents his laws and the commandment. And it's sharper than a two-sided sword. Sharper than both sides. It pierces the word of God. Even dividing the soul and the spirit. One from another. It's that sharp. Joint and marrow. Now, God's word or the sword divides. It judges the thought and the intent of the heart. The thought and the intent. So men may say one thing with your mouth, but God said, because my word is sharper than a two-edged sword, when the word of God gets in there, it's now able to divide between the thought and the intent. Mm. We look at the act and we want to judge based on the act. But what God looks at is not the act or the, the fruit. He looks at the seed and the fruit. The thought and the intent of the mind and the heart. Because we can say one thing with our mouth and mean something totally different on the inside. So he look at the intent. We may say, love you, brother, but our intent is I can't stand you. Hope you trip and fall. He knows the difference. That's what the word does. It judges that. It pierces even divine the soul and spirit, joy and matter. It judges the thought and the intent of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. So his word exposes everything, doesn't it? Everything is uncovered and exposed before his eyes of him whom we must give an account. 
Nobody gets away with anything. I know in our day and time, it seems like they're robbing the bank, right? They're injustice. There's an imbalance taking place. It appears naturally they're getting away with it. Are they? Well, with the eyes of man and what we're seeing on the outside, it appears they got away. But the word just told you that nothing's hidden from the eyes of God. And the word of God will divide the thought, the intent of the heart and mind. It don't matter what they say with their word. God keeps the thought, the intent proper. What the intent was, the thought was, was in the mind and the heart. So everyone will give an account. He said, each man must give an account himself. So nobody gets away with nothing. Just to be aware of that. So that should give us some hope. I mean, at time may appear we be in a place of injustice where it appears like the saints that we just read earlier will be put to death unjustly. They'll kill you and think they're doing God a favor and appear to get away with it unjustly. But I'm here to tell you we serve a just God. We make sure each man be rewarded for everything he has done in his body in word and in deed. God will reward them. Vengeance is mine, said the Lord. I will repay. Don't worry. I will pay each of them to their face, he says. Okay? So nobody gets away with anything. Revelation chapter 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. There's John again, the revelator. We saw Daniel, fell as dead man. We saw Jeremiah, fell as dead man. I'm going to give you some scripture. Show each one encountered the presence of God. Don't stand up and tell God how bold they are, but they fall as dead men. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. The reaction of John to the vision of the exalted Lord is similar to those of uh, those with such experience, as Isaiah 6, 5 says. In Isaiah 6, 5, Then I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. I indwell in the midst of the people on clean lips, for my eyes have seen the King. Very important word. The word Lord is the word King. My eyes have seen the King. Not the pastor, not the bishop, not the deacon. He's seen the King. God is the King. Jesus is the king. Hmm. So our concept of the Bible has got to change from a religious mindset to a kingdom mindset. The Lord of hosts is his name. The Lord of hosts is his name. Isaiah 6, 5. Hmm. And um, also, Manoah was afraid that he should die, but did not fall down as dead, according to Judges 13, 22, and 23. Manoah. And Manoah said unto his wife, We shall surely die because we have seen God. But his wife said unto him, If the Lord was pleased to kill us, he would not have received a burnt offering and a great meat offering at our hands. Neither would he have shown us all these things. Nor would as at this time have told us such things as these. That's in Judges 13, 22-23. They too saw the Lord, and they did not die. But they fell the altar because no one can look upon God and die. By the way, have you wondered why that is? Why can we as human beings in this body, in this flesh, look at God? Hmm. And why would this face to die? Because no flesh, because flesh is tainted by sin. God's eyes so pure and righteous and holy that he can look upon flesh. The blood of Jesus is the covering, in which you may say it's the glasses that he puts on when he comes to deal with you and me. Because that blood covers his eyes from your flesh and your sin and see the righteousness and the glory that lies within you versus the sin nature. Without the blood of Jesus, he could not look upon us. His eye will burn our sinful flesh to nothing. Thus, he cannot look upon sin. That's the reason why. That's why these men were so fearful. Because he now know our flesh is tainted by sin and his eyes too just and pure to look upon sin. He does not look at the near law. Wow. Let's continue. Let's continue. Ezekiel fell on his face but still had his senses. Ezekiel 1.28 says, As the appearance of the bowl that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the lightness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spoke. Daniel lost his strength. He fainted and fell into a deep sleep. Daniel 10, verse 8 through 10. Therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision. And there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned me into corruption, and I retained no strength at all. So whenever anyone encountered God, to think you're going to stand before him in our own strength, not going to happen. Your knee will buckle. 
I'm just telling you. If you don't fall down as dead, okay? No one thus far I've been studying out in this Bible pertaining to the presence of the Lord gets to stand up boldly in your own strength and going to try to declare who you are to him. Doesn't happen. Okay? Unless he gives you the strength to stand. But each one that encountered him fell down as dead. Verse 9. Yet heard I the voice of his word. And when I heard the voice of his word, then was I in a deep sleep and my on my face. And my face toward the ground. And behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees upon the palm of my hands. But John fell down at once as dead. This panic of those good men arose from the notion that people would die when they ever saw God. That's why Jacob wonders and is thankful that he had seen God face to face but stayed alive. Genesis thirty-two thirty. 30. This was a customary position to assume when designed to show respect to a king. It's to fall prostrate, flat on one face before a king. According to 1 Samuel 25, 23. Hmm. To fall prostrate before a king. I'm going to keep reiterating the word until we get home. It was a king. So everything I'm reading to you and describe to you is describing a king. Not a preacher, not a pastor, not a church organization. Um, but you're going to find out it is a throne of a king. The first and the last is a visual exposition of Alpha and Omega. According to Isaiah 44, 6. Do not be afraid. Same here. Christ once told John not to be afraid when he was still the storm. It is I, be not afraid, John 6, 20 tells us, which also mirrors the same word of comfort to the prophet Daniel. Fear not, Daniel, Daniel 10, 12. And also used in the Old Testament to comfort the people of Israel and remove their fear. I, the Lord, the first and the last, Isaiah 41, 4. Do not be afraid. It's the same word and repeated because God is the same yesterday and forever. And throughout history, he's the same. And thus the word remained the same, comfort. Now, verse 18, Revelation chapter 1. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Keys here, in this little chapter, represents what does keys represent in your Bible? What does the key do for you? Well, let's describe keys. Now, Jesus gave, told Peter, when he asked them, who do men say that I am? Peter responds, some say that are a prophet. Some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're this. Some said your whatever word he was using and describing him said, but he said, but who do you say that I am? Then Peter probably said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Then Jesus responded to Peter, flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my father which is in heaven. And upon this rock, I shall call you Cephas or rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That statement there. And he said, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bound in earth, I'll be bound in heaven. So when you look at it in that revelation, what Jesus told Peter, he said, because I'm going to build a church. A church is not a building or location. The word church is the word ecclesia in the Greek, meaning called out and separated people unto himself. Because you are a citizen of God's kingdom, you've been called out and chosen. For you are, Isaiah tells us, for you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that should go forth to show the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Because we have been chosen, that's the key word, and that's what he gave him the key for when Peter had the revelation that Jesus is the Christ. So Jesus now says, based on that revelation, I am the Christ. And that the revelation didn't come from man, but it came from my Father. I will now choose a group of people or citizenry, citizenry that will be based on revelation and truth as to who I am. And the revelation that I am, the Son of the living God. And that will be unique and the gates of hell won't prevail against them. Not people called into ministry through religious organization, but those who has a revelation as to who the Christ is. I will build my church. And that's the key word. And he said, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom, he tells them. What is the key? Key represents the power. And isn't that one of the things we're lacking today in the body of Christ, we call it? What are we lacking? Power. The key represents, keys here represents power, represents authority, represents rights, access, provision, office, knowledge, wisdom, understanding, Gives you the power to lock or to unlock things. Hmm. That's the word. I am the living one. I was dead now. Look, I'm alive. Forevermore. And I hold the keys 
of death and Hades. Why does he hold them? Because he has the power, the authority, the right, the access to give life to whom he wants to give life. Death would also come to who chooses to reject the life offer. And Hades is a place of punishment for those who reject this gift of eternal life. Thus, he has the right of life and death. Why? Because many will reject the way of salvation. They'll find their own way. They reject Christ as not being the Messiah. People justify many things today. He cannot be the one. And so because they reject the only hope of salvation given to man, there's only one way. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to my Father except through me. When they reject the way of salvation, then the one who was supposed to bring life to them and brought them eternal life has forced his hand to now forth to give upon them what they, your just action deserve, which is death and Hades. He doesn't want to do it that way. He took that from the devil who had the power over us before to give us freedom, to give us back to life. But when you reject the only way of salvation and enforce the hand of God, then the only place left for you is death and Hades, eternal death. And he said, he holds the key, indicate total power and authority over death and hell, also in Matthew 16, 19. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. I will give you the keys. That means there's more than one. Can I ask a question? If we have been given keys, not a key, not singular, but keys, how many keys were you given? How many keys have you discovered in your research and study of the Bible? I will give you the keys, meaning there, there's more than one. And if keys give you access, and each door have a different lock on it, because you use a different key, how many doors have you access in heaven based on the keys you've discovered? Hmm. You can have the first key. The first key to get you into God's kingdom is the key of Jesus. But he's just the doorway. He's not the destination. So if you come to Jesus with the key of Jesus and you accept him and you stop there, you can start the death at Jesus because the provision you want is not at Jesus. He said, I'm just a door. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to my father except you go through me. I didn't say come to me. I said go through me. So you turn the key, unlock it, go through him and go meet with the father because where the father is, is the way the provisions are. But we're stuck at Jesus. And we're preaching Jesus. With Jesus, even one John says, Don't, if I preach me, my message ain't true. So we misunderstood. Again, keys give you access to many other areas. Here's another key. Another area where I think we kind of come up short in this also. We have been using only one key to access all the things of heaven that we need. The one key we've been using is the key of prayer. While prayer is one of the most precious and important key, it is not all the keys you've been given. If all you have is the key of prayer, well, prayer don't open the door sometimes of provision, does it? Of investment, does it? Hmm. You can start off in prayer, but there better be a second key of wisdom pertaining to finances. There has to be a key if you want help of health, because you're going to find out healing, most cases, because we don't understand it, don't come to pray for healing. You command healing. You don't pray for healing. I was talking to someone about that today. My friend Lewis, I said, when it comes to healing, I know what we've been told. When you hear somebody sick, you want to pray. But you find that most of the time when you pray, pray don't heal them. Because the key that you need when it comes to healing is to command it. You don't pray for it, you command it. I'm just saying. Study that one out. Go study every miracle of Jesus when it comes to healing or deliverance. Look and listen to what he said and what he did. Show me one place where he prayed for somebody. You won't find it, but do your research and you'll find it for yourself. All right? So he said, he holds the key, indicating total power and authority over death and hell. Also in Matthew 16, 19. In Psalms 116, 3 through 5, the sorrow of death compassed me, and the pain of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I beseech you, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord, righteous, yea, our God is merciful. So we now see the keys of death. Death here, the def definition, the word of death is cease or cessation from function or movement. That's death. In other words, uses dysfunctional. Dysfunctional. That's the word. That's the word death. He said the keys of death are cessation from function or movement or being dysfunctional. One of Jesus' most significant miracles recorded in the Bible was the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead, John 11. There are other instances of people who had been raised from the dead. But like those mentioned before in the Bible, Lazarus had been dead for an entire period of four days. When Lazarus died, Jesus said, Our friend Lazarus sleeps. 
Very important word. I need you to underline that, please. Our friend Lazarus sleeps. But I go that I may wake him up. Ah. You're going to see this idea of sleep resurrection in the book of Revelation we talked about. And the dead in Christ shall rise. Here we see Jesus waking up John, uh, Lazarus, right? That means that if he was already awake, he would have no need to wake him up. So he must have fallen asleep. Oh, okay. I'm going to say something about it in a minute. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, here's our thinking, then he'll get well. That's what I'm not thinking about. If he's asleep, right? Because they're thinking naturally, aren't they? They're not thinking about eternally, spiritually, right? However, Jesus spoke of his death. So according to Jesus, hmm, did he say Lazarus walked around in heaven sipping iced tea and eating cherries and walking the lamb with the lion? Is that what he said? No, he says he's asleep. Oh, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about him taking rest in sleep. According to John 11, 11 through 13, right? We now see death, according to Jesus, is still be asleep. The dead in Christ shall rise. If they're walking around, it would say, the dead in Christ is walking around, they shall come down. That's not what the Bible says. The dead in Christ shall rise, then we who are alive remain shall together meet him in the air. So death, according to Jesus, is to sleep. The idea, I don't want to create controversy for you, but some of you need to think this through, that death is sleep, right? That means your time, years pass, and it's like a moment. Hmm. I know when we told grandma was up there walking around with Jesus, and oh, when my grandma sits the brother, aunt, uncle, I'm sorry, I appreciate that. Ah, he said, I go to wake him up. And then when he went to wake him up, did he pray, oh Lord, I pray you wake up John, all this, no, 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 no. He said, Lazarus, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, St. John. Lazarus, he says, come forth. He shouted, right? Because it was a command. It wasn't a prayer thing. It was a command. Come forth. And the man came walking out. Are oh, you see it? His friend had died. He did not pray. He commanded him with a shout, with a sound. And Lazarus came walking out. Jesus spoke of his death. However, when Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking a rest and sleep. So we now see the Bible compares death to sleep. More than 50 times in your Bible. More than 50 times in your Bible, death is compared to sleep. Hmm. After death, we are asleep. We are unconscious. We are not aware of the passing of time or what is going on around us. That is what death is like as well. The Bible says, for the living know that they will die. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. Their love, their hatred, their envy have now perished, according to Ecclesiastes 9, 5. In the New King James, Psalms 146, 4 and 115, 17, it makes sense that after Lazarus was raised from the dead, he doesn't share what he saw or experienced. He didn't have anything to tell except that once he was dead and now he's alive. He didn't experience hell or heaven. He was simply sleeping in his tomb. Peter on the day of Pentecost said the same of King David. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us today. For David did not ascend into the heavens. That's, oh Lord Jesus, that's Acts 2, 29 and verse 34, if you want to read it. This is in presenting. Hades here is a synonym of death. Revelation 5, 24. 5 through 29. The word Hades is a Greek word. In the ancient Greek religion and the myth is the god of the dead, the king of the underworld, which is called Hades, with which his name becomes synonymous. Hades was the eldest son of Cronus and Rhea, although this also made him the, least, the, the last son of the regurgitated by, by his father. He and his brother Zeus and Poseidon defeated his father's generation of gods and titans and claimed rulership over the cosmos. So you have probably seen this recently, the story of Hades and Zeus and Poseidon. Um, I don't remember the title of the movie that's out right now. Hades received the underworld, Zeus the sky, Poseidon the sea, and with the solid earth long the province of Gaia, available to all three concurrently. That's the word of Hades, that's where it came from. 
Verse 19, write the things which you have seen, the things which are, the things which shall take place at this. Bear witness of what you have heard and you have seen. Right? The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angel of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Mm, are the seven churches. Mm. By the way, the churches here are not the building or location of a building, but represents the body of Christ throughout the world. So when he talks about the seven churches at that time, it was not a building or location. It was a seven body of believers that were established throughout this area in Turkey at their time. And that was what he was called the body or the church at that time. First Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Hmm. Question, the proof to you what I'm saying to you is right. When Jesus come back, if he's talking about these churches, seven churches, is he coming back for the building or people in a certain location or is he coming for you, the body of Christ? I think he's coming back for you. That's what I first went in trying to tell you. Do you not know your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Who's he coming for? You and I, the body. We are his temples. That's the church. You and I are the church. But the word church is not building location. It means called out and separated ones unto God. Ah, Interesting. Mm. He said, do you not know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is, who is in you? Where's the church? In you? Where's the church? In you? Uh, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your church or your body. <laughs> so when he comes back here, he comes no building location, he comes back for you. He said, in your body, which is my temple, keep it clean. Honor him with your bodies. Do the right thing. Do not destroy my temple. Because if you do, you're not going to have a problem. If you destroy God's temple, he's very clear. God will destroy you. He's serious about this. Because I dwell in you. You are my temple. Your bodies belong to me. Therefore, honor the Lord with your bodies. How you live. What you put in it. How you treat it. Romans 12, 5 says, So, so we, who are many, are of one body. Individually, we are members of one another. In other words, our bodies are made of the same material called dirt or humus, and thus we have the same body. So God dwells in the human body. We are his temple. And we are members. Why are we members? Because we are made up the same from the same family, made in the image of God. Thus we are members of one another. Colossians 1.18 says, Colossians 1.18, he is the head of the body. The building, location, no. The head of the body, the church, which you and I are. Right? So he's the head of the church. He is the beginning, the first one from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. So he is the head of the body. Not a preacher, not a pastor, not an omniscient. He's the head of the body. But if they believe that the body is a location in a building, and that the building is the edifice, even though they say contradictory to that, that you, your body is that temple, then, then you understand why they call them the head of the body. But according to this, Christ is the head of the body. That the church that Jesus would build, Christ is the head. Doesn't say a man, doesn't say a priest, a preacher. He said Christ is the head of that church. Mm. So he is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the first from the dead. So that he might have first place in everything. Jesus Christ is seen as the head of the body which is the church, while the members of the body are seen as the member of the church. Or, that's the confusion, right? The church, ecclesia. Not the gathering, but the called out and separated ones. The ecclesia, the gathering. Thus, the reason why in Revelation 1.13, Son of Man is in the midst of the church. The stars and the lampstand are the sacred interpretation and symbolism of the heavenly and the earthly lights. The stars and the lampstand are the sac sacred interpretation of the symbolism of of the heavenly and the earthly lights. In other words, the church are the light, and thus they are lit around the lampstand or the menorah, and thus in the midst of this stand the light of the world, which is Jesus himself. Seven star, he referred to seven churches in Asia Minor, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Fire Tower, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, where the twelve stars in other parts of the Bible, where, whereas the twelve stars in other parts of the Bible, Genesis 37, 9, Revelation 12, 12, 1 represents the 12 tribe of Israel, not the church. According to Genesis 37, 9, Revelation 12, 1 represents the 12 tribe of Israel, not the church. 
Genesis 37 9 he dreamed he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers said look I have dreamed another dream speaking of Joseph and this time the sun moon and the eleven star bowed down to me the dream in Genesis 39 brings to mind another book in the Bible the very last book in 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 fact take a look at Revelation 12 1 through 6 now a great sign appeared in heaven a woman clothed with the sun with the moon under her feet and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then, being with child, she cried out in labor, in pain, to give birth. Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems on his head. His tail threw a third part of the star of heaven, and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, who was ready to give birth, to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Her child was called up to God and to his throne, according to Revelation chapter 12, verse 1 through 6. We can say it. Now, these are the only two places in the Bible with signs, with a sign featuring the sun, the moon, and the 12 stars. And the interpretation is given. In Genesis 37, Jacob gave the interpretation because he knew exactly what the sun, moon, and star were, his family. The sign represents Jacob himself, Jacob's wife, and Joseph's mother, Rachel, all of, her, all of his sons, who would become the heads of 12 tribes of Israel. It's all right there. No guessing required. So in his dream in the book of Genesis, the interpretation is given. He said he saw the sun when the star bowed to him. And so we see very clearly. That he gave the interpretation because he knew exactly what the sun, moon, and stars were in his family. The signs represent Jacob himself, the signs Jacob himself, Jacob's wife, Jacob's mother, Rachel, and all his sons who would become the heads of 12 tribes. Bollinger, note that there was an officer in the signal who was called Sheliak, Tabor, uh, Tabor, of the angel of the assembly, meaning assembly, um, is or sent one or messenger. The function as a cantor or mouthpiece of the congregation, the leader of the divine worship, his duty was to offer a public prayer to God for the whole congregation. That is, as the messenger of the assembly, he spoke to God for them. <clears throat> this position is below the chief officer or ruler of the synagogue. The use of the word synagogue in two of the seven letters, Revelation 2.9, and 3.9, giving support to this interpretation. Wow, well, coming to the end. I'm not even going to get this done. Thank you, I'm getting there. Now, the angel of the seven church. Who are the angel of the seven church? I think I described them to you what they are. <clears throat> in Revelation 8, verse 1 through 4, introduce seven angels who will sound their trumpet in Revelation chapter 8 and 9. After the seven seals is opened, John sees the seven angel who stand before God, standing before. Someone in the Indian. Indian <clears throat> idiomatic expression for serving, so that this could be translated serving the Lord. According to the Jewish tradition, the angel must be standing because they have had no knees. That's actually a biblical interpretation. This is based on Ezekiel 1 7. Cherubims with straight legs. Now, that's their interpretation of it. The seven angels in Revelation chapter 8 1 through 4 does not identify them. And these are the seven archangels who will occupy a very particular role in the angelic hierarchy. As David um, suggests, on the other hand, Beale revealed, revealed, Beals finds it tempting to identify them with the seven guardian angels of the seven churches. John may have in, intended these seven angels standing before God to be the seven spirits which are before the throne of God. Revelation chapter 1 verse 4. Of the Second Temple period, literature referred to the seven archangels, Michael and Gabriel being among them, for example. In Tobit 12.15, the angel Raphael says, I am Raphael, one of the seven holy angels who present the prayers of the saints and enter into the presence of the glory of the Holy One. This is Raphael, according to Tobit 12.15. The tradition of seven archangels is present in the um, the archipelago. The, the Apocalypse, Book of the Apocalypse of Tobit. In the Testament Levi 8, Levi sees seven men clothed in wine who prepare him to be a priest. So again, the word seven being repeated over and over again as I read to you earlier. Now here's where it really gets very interesting. And I'm going to end it here tonight with this. In 1 Enoch chapter 20, the Greek text had seven angels. Here are the names of the seven angels. Uriel, Raphael, Ragiel, Michael, Seriel, Gabriel, and Remiel. Hmm. 
Have you noticed these L's in their names? Very interesting, huh? In the book of Enoch, chapter 1, verse 20, the Greek text had given the angel's name, Uriel, Raphael, Raguel, Michael, Sariel, Gabriel, and Remiel. That's the name. That's, that's in the missing Ethiopian text, by the way. I got that from. Sariel, <clears throat> each of the names have a different meaning to them. This is what they mean. So we're going to start with Sariel, um, one of the holy angels, for he is of eternity and of trembling. That's his name, of eternity and of trembling. Raphael, one of the holy angels, for he is of the spirit of man. Makes sense, he'll stand before God. Eternity and trembling, spirit of man. Ragiel, one of the holy angels, who took vengeance for the world and for the luminaries. His name is Ragiel. He took vengeance for the world and for the luminaries. Now, what are the luminaries? The sun, the stars, and different regions of the universe. Michael, one of the holy angels, for he is obedient in his malevolence, over the people and of all the nation, also known as the warring angel. That's Michael. Um, we have now Sarah Guel, one of the holy angels who are set over the spirit of mankind, whose sin is in the spirit, who sins in the spirit. So his job is set over mankind, the spirit of mankind who sins in the spirit. Hmm. Gabriel, one of the holy angels who oversees the Garden of Eden. And the serpents and the cherubim, also known as the messenger angel. That's Gabriel. So we see each and every one of them have a different title, different assignment. Thus they stand in the presence of the Lord. And each one represents a certain responsibility or role they'll play in the end time pertaining to the life of men. According to 3 Enoch 70, it says there are seven great, beautiful, wonderful, honorable, honored prince who are in charge of the seven heavens. These are Michael, Gabriel, Satiel, Sagiel, Barudiel, Bar um, Barquiel, and Sacriel. These are the seven according to three Enoch seventeen. Seven these these are there are seven great, beautiful, wonderful, honored princes who are in charge of the seventh heaven. And of course, there that's the name of them. However, Revelation eight two, the angels are not named. Nor are they described as special in any way except that they are given the honor of announcing the judgment by blowing on trumpets. There is another series of angels, Revelation 15, 16, as the final bold judgment are poured out on the earth. Now, I don't give any great description as to who they are. I just name them as angel. But if each angel have a role in the assignment, it makes sense they will be the one pouring out the vial of God's wrath because it represents certain nature, attribute, and character of God. And each one has a role that they play. But it's amazing to study back far enough to find out what they're there for, what they represent. They represent the Spirit of God in his presence, but also there are those who look over the churches, and they're the discerner of the heart, they watch over them, they protect them, they're on assignment to watch over the seven churches of God. In chapter 2, we're going to describe to you the seven churches, so we're going to describe to you what God has to say about them, and if the seven spirits or seven angels are there to guard and protect them, it makes sense, he knew, he said, this you have gone for, but this I have against you. Huh. Now, he's a discern of the thought and intent of the heart and the mind, doesn't it? He says, and he's going to describe each of the churches. Each of the churches, he represents not a location, but a more so a people called out, separated, who's in this journey of walking with God in kingdom living, but however, got sidetracked by something, got distracted from the main reason as to why they're serving the Lord. Either forgot things, or they got caught up in things, or they appear to be something that they're not. And God says, this I have, and I say this is good about you, but I have this against you. Oh, and it talks about our character and our nature. So I'm going to define and break down for you the seven churches and what God says about them, where they are, where they're located. We now know modern day. And in chapter two, he's going to talk about where the throne of Satan is. We're going to describe that to you as well. 
So my hope is that you got some insight tonight. My time has come to an end. I was able to finish up in three parts. Excited about that. Please go back and listen. I gave you a lot of material to study out, research, do some research for yourself. Any area we have questions about, don't hesitate to ask those questions and go seek the answer or write me and I'll give you as much answer as I can in my research as well. But my hope is that you get some insight to recognize Revelation chapter one. We just got the first part done. We go to the chapter two now and go to chapter three and see where the whole spirit leads from there. But God bless y'all. We love you. Look forward to seeing you next week. My time's come to end and I still have some time left over. We will definitely see you again next week again in the part chapter two. God bless you. We love you. Bye-bye now.